Hi, everyone. My name is Raziel Kane, and I'm back with another interview. Can you believe it's my sixth interview of a legendary voice actor? And those of you who know me know I've been waiting to interview Paul Eiding for a long time, and I'm very happy. There he is, Paul Eiding. Hiya, hiya. So, um, how, are, how are you today, sir? Doing good? All is well. I can't complain. Perfect. And yeah. I'm Thank you for taking the time and thank you for everyone in the chat already showing up. So we have Lone Dragon. Yeah, my girlfriend, Katrin, she a uh, big supporter of my channel. You know, you, you need a, a special lady to understand the collection, you know, and Indeed. The, the, the time it takes to do everything. And Memo, my, my partner in crime, we've been, uh, we kind of started at the same time. So uh, it's cool to have him. Uh, show up uh, on my stream so another great uh, good reviewer and lone dragon um another you know good supporter of the show and hopefully other people will show up so people i will take questions once in a while and of course i will filter out any question about uh writing intent stuff like that um you know what do you think your your character would have done in this situation blah 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 none of that i'm i really i've doing my spotlights and the interviews i've really fallen for the business of voice acting that's what i want to focus on but i do have some other question that really when i do my research i'm like how 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 was this how did this happen so well, there you go so i'm ready for anything so chris milchev another uh, supporter thanks for showing up mercenary terror that's a new one i think so thanks for uh, stopping by and uh we're going to get started um, so everybody, uh, if, well, if anybody watched the review, the spotlight I did on you, they know that you started as a musician. That's what you majored in. Uh, but then when you were in the third infantry Marni Glee club in Germany, you transitioned to, um, acting, uh, on the advice of one of your colleagues. And, well, you have uh, done your homework, haven't you? I, I tried to <laughs> work very, very uh, diligently. So, because I have to say the fact that I do the homework, that's what gets me the interview with a lot of people because they know it's not going to be something foolish. So that's, you know, one of the things John Machida told me, he said, I wasn't worried going in because I knew you, you knew your stuff. So, so how early in life did you know that you wanted to be a performer? Oh, wow. Um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a hard one. Um, I knew from an early, early age that I couldn't do uh, it, what I used to call a regular job. Mm -hmm. I just knew that um, from, from middle school, uh, never thought about that I was going to be a performer. I always thought I was going to be a musician uh, because that was my love. But I knew that I couldn't do like a regular nine to five job. It just it just didn't appeal to me. I didn't think that I could sit that that long uh, and do the same thing over and over and over and over again. God bless anybody who can do that um, because the world would be in a, a, a pickle if we didn't have folks who could uh, who could do that. Um, Listen, even in school, when we had to do reports, mm. whether uh, English or history uh, or geography or whatever, you could either write a report uh, or a school would allow you to do an oral report. I always chose the oral report. Um, so I guess uh, I was getting off on the performing then. Um uh, enjoying the response that I got from the other students and the teacher, you know. Um, and did you participate in school plays or were you just focusing on music back when you no, were younger? I, uh, in our middle school, uh, they, they would do plays, and I did one play. And because my voice was deeper than most of the other kids, uh, even then, and because I was always... Um, always chubby, a little overweight. Okay. Uh, I always got to play the adults. Um, oh, 
Okay. So, and I remember that my first play was in uh, in middle school. Uh, well, we call it junior high, Addison Junior High School in Cleveland, Ohio. And um, I played a school teacher. The, 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 the show was called Curtain Going Up, and it was about a drama teacher putting on a play. And I played the, I, I played the principal, and I kind of had a crush on the drama teacher. And at the end of the play, there was a moment where we had to kiss. And I actually kind of had a crush on the girl anyway. But that moment, we never kissed during all of the rehearsals. Um, I right. think we only we only had one performance, <laughs> and I remember the little very innocent um, closed mouth pit kiss, and of course the crowd went crazy. The kids watching their peers kiss in front of them on a stage uh, went crazy, and I kind of liked that. I liked the reaction that they uh, that they gave us, and then in in uh, high school. I only did one play in high school okay. Um, called Arsenic on Old Lace. And I played, um, um, uh, what was his, Dr. Einstein, who was kind of a sniveling, sniveling little coward of the really bad guy. Okay. And that, that was one. I was comic relief. And then I, okay. I did some, I did some uh, a couple of plays in college, but most of it was music. Uh, my, my, my bent was... Uh, classical music, playing, end up playing with the Cleveland Orchestra. That's that was my dream. From in those in those days. In those days, and yeah. then you you did you you enrolled to, in the army. You volunteered or you were drafted? Nope, I joined. You joined, and then yeah, I, I was one of those guys. Uh, we were a, a blue collar family. Okay. And all of my uncles, uh, my five uncles, had all served during uh, uh, the Second World War. And uh, stepfather, uh, I don't know if he, he was in, but he was, they were all, oh, I had cousins who went in, into uh, the Korean um, battle. It wasn't a war. Uh, okay. So our country says. Uh, <laughs> but um, so we were everybody that's what you did you get to a certain age and you serve your country okay uh, so I actually dropped out of college and because uh, the music program was terrible and I joined and uh, I was in for three years and I got sent to Germany and once I got to Germany, uh, they decided what division you were going to be sent to. So I was sent to the Third Infantry Division, okay, which, which was the it was called the Audie Murphy Division because it was Audie Murphy was the most decorated soldier in the Second World War, so it had a real you know proud history. And when I got to where I was supposed to be in in uh, in Würzburg, Germany. There was a gentleman there who asked everyone to raise their hand if they played an instrument or sang. And I did both. So I raised my hand and they told me to go into this room. Uh, so along with, I guess there are 12 or 13 other guys. We went into this room and there was a gentleman sitting at a piano. And he, uh, he oh, at, at he said, uh, uh, what's your name? And he, and he says, before you tell me your name, uh, I'm guessing names today. And he said, you look like a Paul, which was not my name. Um, but I never really was crazy about my name. So I said, yeah, cool. I'll okay. be Paul. All right. And I auditioned uh, as a bass player and as a singer. And I got into the group. Uh, as a um, singing bass and playing the bass. And somehow within six months, I was directing uh, the group. Okay. And I, I stayed there the entire time I was in the military. So so that that was one of my very like personal questions, that 
did you do that? Like at that point, did you solely do that, you know, putting a show together or is that in between round, like doing guard duty or do, I, I'm not a military guy, but like right. is it something that you have to, to, to focus completely on or it, this is just after you're done your rounds, you do this. No, we were we were part of special services. Okay. We, well, it, it, it was an interesting group because it wasn't an actual um, unit that was off, totally authorized by the military. We were there under the, the auspices of the, the, the commanding general. The commanding general wanted to have his own um, his own group. There was what they called the Army Chorus. That right. was in another uh, uh, another part of the uh, uh, of Germany, and he wanted his own. So they had this group put together called the Marne Glee Club, and the we would perform at uh, uh, servicemen clubs where all the soldiers would go on their free time. You go there to play games. Uh, you go there for. Um, just to hang out, you know. And then we would also perform for NCOs, for sergeants, their club, and office, the officers' club. And every once in a while, which became a lot more common, we started performing for the German nationals and for big events. We would we went and we, we performed in Brussels at uh, SHAPE headquarters, military headquarters. We performed a lot. Uh, around Germany, we went to Denmark and performed. Um, and then we would also perform out in the field for guys right before. It, it was like Bob Hope. Uh, they would string uh, lights between howitzer tanks and have microphones and we put our instruments there. And we would perform with the troops before they were heading out um, to go to a war, you know? So, uh, that, so that's the part that boggles me. Like how hard is it to perform for people that either came back or are about to go in combat situation. So they're, you know, trying not to die for a day and then they, they go and then you have to entertain them. And so that's why, I, that's why I wanted to know if it was really a focus for you to just do that you know, keep the morale up and do the stuff or because I was thinking if you do that in between getting shot at, that's insane. But no, uh, we were strictly for that purpose. Okay. To, to keep the morale up. Okay. Uh, now what happened was we would be there. Normally you're, you're, uh, you're sent to, uh, to a unit for uh, anywhere from 11 to 13 months. And then you rotate back to the States. Okay. And then when you take back to the States, then you are sent wherever they want to send you, off into war. Okay. Um, to stay in, plus to stay into in our group, you had to be really good. You had to learn your music. You had to, you had to look a certain way. You had to look like soldiers because we were representing uh, not... The, the United States of America, we were representing our, uh, the Army, we were representing our general. Uh, so we had to, we used to call it play the game. You, we had to go out, we had to train on with rifles and all that stuff. We would go off to the field. And uh, so if something happened, we were ready. Okay. But 80% but of the time was strictly learning music. Learning our routines because we, we did a lot of physical stuff, uh, like choreography. Okay. And if somebody didn't, uh, wasn't pulling his weight or started screwing up in some way, taking advantage of where they were, then it was up to me uh, to let them go. Oh. And once, once you let someone go from our group, then they could have been sent to war. Yeah. Okay. And a couple that, of them a couple of them had to go. So that's a lot of pressure on you. I was 21 years old. Yeah, I was 21 years old leading this group. 
I was one of the youngest guys there, but I also, uh, because I was a music major, I was one of the few that could uh, could teach music as well as, as, you know what I mean? And yeah. plus I had, I had a, I could sing back in the day, I could sing first, first uh, tenor parts all the way down to the lowest bass. So I could teach the parts that way as well. Okay. Um, in fact, the best thing that ever happened, usually I, I should have been shipped back to the States just like everyone else. Right. You're but, right because, okay. but because I built the group up, we went from, when I got into the group, there were nine in the group. When I left, we had 32 in the group. My feeling was I wanted to keep as many guys there and safe yeah. as possible. And they let me build it up to 32. Um, and so the commanding general thought that I was invaluable. So I stayed my entire time in the military right there. And they tried to get me to re-enlist. And I told them, that if you could guarantee that this is what I would be doing, I would think about it. But they couldn't guarantee that. So I said, no. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for answering this because that was – one of my when I did my research, and that was one of the things. I if I ever get the, the chance, I I need to explore that part of your your uh, history. You know, to, to just to, to understand. I mean, that's a great experience, but also I don't think there was anything else you could have done after that had that much pressure on you. So you you, it's, you know what it, it's uh, it's. Interesting that you mentioned that because uh, I've talked to my wife about this several times. It was really tough, um, especially if, at my age. I was, yeah. and here's the other thing: we had several members of the group who were gay. Back in the day, yeah, you couldn't talk about that sort of stuff. Um, although there were lots of gay guys in the, uh, army. Uh, in the army, always have been. And always will be. But back then, um, they didn't talk about it. And had people found out that there were, uh, actually, there were six guys in the group who were, who were gay. If they had done something that brought too much attention to homosexuality, our group would have been closed down. Because we were supposed to be a soldier. In fact, there was a... The theme song for the for the Third Infantry Division was called "The Dog Face Soldier," and it's it it's a fun song, but it's all about you know it, it goes I, I wouldn't give a bean to be a fancy pants marine, I'd rather be a dog face soldier like I am. I wouldn't trade my old ODs for all the Navy's dungarees, for I'm the walking pride of Uncle Sam, uh, and then and it goes from there. Mm -hmm. So we had to really look the part, and for me, it was acting. We were <laughs> we were acting the part. So there was actually a time when I had to tell these guys that they had to be cool, and I felt like I felt horrible about telling somebody that they had to be. Yeah, have be to careful. act straight, basically. So they're acting twenty four seven. You know exactly, absolutely unfair to them. Abs yes. Um. But um, but they're and and uh, I'm and in touch with a couple of the guys to this day. It, it's just that was some of the most. Uh, it was trying, but also uh, it really made me grow in so many ways. Oh, and I, I I cherish those the, uh, that time with the Morning Glee Club. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah. You you mentioned you know growing, and I, I'm. I guess it kind of makes you skip a couple of steps, you know, of, you know, me when I was <laughs> 21, I was with a roommate playing video games and, you know, had no care in the world. So yeah. I think I had just moved out of my parents' house, you know, and uh, I must have been it, like, I mean, it's un incomparable how much growth you must have had to do to, you know, save these people and put on that show. And it's amazing. All right, so and sorry everybody in the chat. <laughs> I guess that was sorry, guys. something. No, but it's good. Uh, we have a couple new uh, newcomers. Zeta Prime, he's a upcoming YouTuber, and uh, NY Hunter, great guy. 
and Memo had to run. And uh, I do have a question from Chris here. Uh, he wants to know how was the audition process on the original Ben 10 show? Do you have a favorite Grandpa Max moment? Um, <laughs> yeah, the original audition uh, for Grandpa Max was interesting because, uh, and thanks for the question, man. Uh, when I first auditioned for Grandpa Max, they wanted, they said kind of a, a folksy sort of sound to him. So there was this the slightest, slightest twang, you know, sort of a country sort of feel to him. Mm -hmm. So I said, Ben, Ben, now you, you got to make sure, Ben, it's not important that, what, that you know that you did something right. No, not other people know you did something right. It's important that you know you did something right. Okay. And I got cast. Okay. And about the third episode, it never felt right to me. Okay. I just didn't feel like it was in the pocket, you know, about, the, and I think it was like the third episode, we would go over lines and, and the, the director would say, okay, well, let's try it again. And we do it again. Then they asked me at the, at the, at the end of the episode, if I would stay after. So I said, okay, well, I'm getting fired. Um, yeah, I said, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm done. Uh, it's not, it just isn't working out. So, okay. Um, and then we played uh, for a while with different, different tones for Grandpa Max. Um, and then we finally came, we finally came up with what, what ended up being just pretty much just me down here a little bit, Ben, you know, um, yeah. forgetting the twang, any of that kind of stuff. And it, thank, luckily for me, it, it, uh, it was what, what we came up with and it worked and they were happy. Oh, yeah, for a long time, it was my oldest, he's 20 now, and it was one of his favorite shows. Would uh, never miss a bet then. Love that. I love doing that show. It was a great crew. Uh, funny thing is that I had to audition again. Each each new uh, when they did Alien Force, yeah, a new a group of uh, writer producers would come in and director. And each time you would have to, they wanted to re audition. I had to re audition for Grandpa Max because when they went with Ben being fifteen. They said, well, it's five years, so maybe Grandpa Max has, maybe he's not as strong as he was. Maybe there's a little, maybe there's a little more air in his voice, or maybe not just a little more gravel in the voice or whatever. Went back and forth, and finally he said, it's only five years. Yeah. And an adult's voice doesn't change that much in just five years. So we ended up with just staying with Grandpa Max. But it was interesting that I had to, we auditioned for Grandpa Max. Yeah, which is a great role. So, and, but that I, because I know now there's other iteration of Ben 10 where you didn't, uh, you know, get to, to the, the boys Grandpa Max. And to me, right. that's just, I understand sometimes the business need, you know, they they want to have, like they did it with Transformers Animated where they recast everything and they want to have, you know, a younger Optimus Prime. So they big gave it uh, David K. Uh, who was usually Megatron at, in, for that period, and so it's just it, and David K is what who's doing uh, ended up doing Grandpa Max. Oh, did he? See, yeah. I haven't done a spotlight on him yet. Um, out of sheer intimidation, his website has so much stuff on it, and there's no way I can fit a spotlight that's going to do honor to all the work he did. He did. Yeah, I, I, I've I've never liked him. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay, no, but it's cool. <laughs> he's 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 one of the kindest, the most talented guys that I know, um, and and uh, and we told me that he said they want me to audition. And I said, David, I'm not. You never get upset with another actor uh, who gets yeah. takes over a role that you're doing. It's not the actor. It's it's the folks who make the uh, decisions upstairs, exactly, uh, or elsewhere. Uh, I love Dave. He's 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 just a good man, you know, and he's incredibly talented, you know. Yeah, to me, he's that uh, next generation Frank Welker. Yeah, 
you know, and, and Frank Welker was the new generation of Mel Blanc. Oh, don't so, forget Eric Bauza. Eric Bauza is in there too. I have to, I'm going to have to look that name up. I'm not familiar. Look with up that. Eric Bauza. You'll see. Okay. Eric Bauza, he's another Canadian. Um, those damn Canadians have come down taking all those jobs uh, <laughs> along with Tara because they're so good. Uh, Eric Bauza, B A U Z A. Okay. He, he came on to Ben 10. And in one episode, I turned to him and I said, you're, you're going to blow up because he's got it all. He can do, he can match anybody's voice. They'll say, well, can you do this? He's got it. Yeah, okay. look him up. He's another. He's just amazing. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. No, no problem. Um, all right, next question. Uh, I'm just going to check uh, in the chat. No, no new question. All right, so... Um, who were your inspiration growing up? Like, or did you have mentors or someone that really encouraged you to follow this path? Um, voiceover wise, the guy who the guy who told me that I should be an actor was the guy that I was in the army with. Yeah, an African American actor by the name of John Hancock. Uh, he's about six foot three, an incredible basso voice. Okay. Who, sh who should have been the director of the the Morning Glee Club, but he he didn't have that temperament. He didn't want to do it. Um, and he had been an actor. He was actually in the movie Dirty Harry, way back before all of you were born, with Clint okay. Eastwood. Um, and he was in the original cast of Roots. He's done several things. He was an actor before he got drafted. And okay. he's the one we would, after performances, we would go back to the barracks. And after you perform, you, you know, your adrenaline is pumping and you're not sleepy. And so we would go back and we'd improv or we'd sit and read plays. Okay. And we read a play called Zoo Story, two character play. And when we finished reading it, he said, Paul, this is what you should do. You're an actor. Um, and you know the, the history. I did shows before, yeah. but that's when I heard somebody who I had great respect for as an actor and as a man. I listened to him. So when I got out, went back to college, did some shows, and it started doing community theater. As far as voiceover is concerned, um, for me it was those guys that I ended up working with. Michael Bell? Oh, my God. Uh, Paul Winchell. Uh, when I first got out to Los Angeles, I had an audition for, a, a, I think it was just a, a voiceover for a commercial. Okay. And I went to this audition, and there was Paul Winchell there. Paul, I had watched Paul Winchell when I was a kid because he had a, a he was a ventriloquist. Oh, was, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jerry Mahoney and Knucklehead Smith. Um, and his show was sponsored by Nestle's. I even remember the it was at N E S T L E S. Nestle's make the very best, and it was a dog <laughs> called Farfall. It's a chocolate. Um, and I and for him, him to be sitting across from me, he was also a man who invented the first artificial heart. Um, okay. It was actually used in uh, change. Okay, it's, it was amazing. Well, because he worked with um, uh, dummies and whatnot, he built things, but he also invented the first mechanical heart. Okay, um, wow. it was used. Yeah, in um, for humans. Yeah. Anyway, but um, it, I'm gonna throw a name in there, Clive Revel. Yeah. Clive Revel. You have a great story about Clive Revel. Oh. Uh, uh, because my first love is theater, then that's where I came from. Um, when I got to do the Transformers with these people, Michael Bell, um, Clive, Oppenheimer, you know, um, yes, that's right, Ellen. It's like these are guys that I watched on TV from MASH to whatever, and I remembered Clive from when he did. On Broadway, uh, Oliver, he played Fagin. 
who is the the lead, you know, the bad guy who who gets these kids to steal for him. Yeah. And I never had the nerve to to really go up to him while we were re recording the show back in the eighties because I was in awe of these guys. Um. But when we did a con a couple of years ago out here in Los Angeles, and there were like 20 of us from G1 okay, who were there, you know, writers and actors. Mm -hmm. And I went up to him and I said, you know, Clive, who's now he's like this, because um, he's got to be in his late 80s or 90s by now. Um, sounds about and, right. And I was fanboying. And I, I told him that that I was so in, enamored with him because of uh, I'd been a follower of his from from theater days, and but I never had the nerve to say anything that I, I just really respected him. And he came up to me, and he put his hands on my shoulders, and he said, "Close your eyes," and I I did, and he sang in my ear very quietly the first chorus of pick a pocket or two and i got chills and it just took me back to that first time that i that i heard him and uh, i wanted to cry because it was like so moving yeah so when i do that with with folks when i when they say you know i remember from this and i tell them close your eyes i want them to know that i had the same <laughs> he had the same effect on me that uh them hearing something from their youth has on them uh yeah that's awesome i love that story honestly to get because the fact that you know there's a lot of people a lot of actors that don't want to do what they call monkey tricks you know to say oh can you say this line can you say that line and i respect that you know it's not for everyone but you take the time you do it and it's, the fans will remember that forever well so, for me uh, for me it's like what am i without fans of my work yeah well i could be the the finest actor in the world in my living room if no one sees it if no one cares about it exactly you that's it, one thing that you quickly became and I'm, I'm not using flattery you quickly became one of my favorite voice actors when i realized how much time we actually spent together when i was growing up from transformers uh, and after that, to uh, Diablo, which I've played this game. It was a job for me. It was 40 <laughs> hours a week. I was completely immersed in the Di Diablo universe, the first one. Uh, second one, and then after that, I kind of trailed off. But to find out that you were Pepin, the healer. Pepin, the healer. Uh, you, uh, la you were Lazarus. Lazarus. Which is a very different voice. Uh, yeah. you, you did the voiceover for the warrior, the, the, the player character warrior. Right. And um, you also, all the narration is done by you. All those tomes that we find and then it starts speaking, it's all you. And it, it it's, it's chilling. It's it's so good. And also the um, uh, the knight Lagdanan, who basically he wants, oh, uh, right. he wants to rest his soul. He needs an elixir. You find it, you bring it to him, and then he gives you his helmet. So I know these are your characters. And so we we spend 40 hours a week together, you know? So when I that's what I love about when I started two years ago doing Spotlights, is realizing, like, Michael Bell, oh, my God, he's Raziel. And then you in, in Diablo. And I, unfortunately, never had the chance. To, I never picked up Metal Gear Solid. So it's, it's not a franchise I'm familiar with. But I know it's very popular a lot of people like your facebook profile is still you and that beret <laughs> for so yeah that's still um looks good yeah it's still um and they're, they're just doing a re-release of uh three of the games so it can be played on any um um any format and they're doing a um uh a th in three they're, they're, it's, it looks beautiful. They're just really uh, upgrading it and updating it. Right. So are they using the same soundtrack as before and just updating the graphics, or you're going to have to rework those? 
my assumption is they said they're going to use the same voice actors. Now, if it's just the old, I have not heard any, I haven't been contacted by anybody. Okay. So they may just be using all the old stuff. Okay. But if the graphics are, are uh, 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 just amazing to look at. Well, you know what? Maybe that's my chance to pick it up and, uh, you know, experience it. I think, I think just getting a feel for who you are, I think you'd really like it because it's, uh, it's brilliantly written. It's it's so smart. That's what I like. Like that's it's why I so like smart. Legacy of Kane games. Uh, yeah. Michael Bell. The story was so intricate and well written, and that's that's what I you know I I also enjoyed them. You know, once in a while the action flick. Like I went to see the new Transformers movie yesterday. How is Rise it? of the Beast? It's a movie. That's that's okay. I I still don't know if I like it, but you know it it was intriguing. But I prefer intricate story and uh, you know character growth. That's important to me. So yeah, so what are you from everything that you've done? You've worked in every medium, theater, live action. You did a fantastic. For those of you in the chat or people who are going to watch this later, if you have not watched Frank and Emmett which is a short movie available on Paul Lighting's YouTube channel. This is the most touching story I have ever watched. And it's just, it's amazing. And the ending is just so, ouch. You know, it's like, ah, this is so good. You did an amazing job for that. But oh, thank it, you, my friend. No, it, it was truly, truly amazing. But what are you most recognized for in the streets? You walk down the aisle, you're at the grocery shop. <laughs> hey, I know that voice. Oh, uh, it, honestly, it's, um, let's see, the most I've, it's been uh, Metal Gear. Okay. Well, I have, I, I went into a, uh, in my neighborhood, this is several years ago, um, I was at the, at the speaker, and I was ordering, it was at Wendy's. And I ordered a, a Wendy's and uh, a, a burger and, and fries and uh, a Sprite. And the guy said, excuse me, I got to tell you something. You sound like, like somebody. And I said, well, who do I sound like? He said, it's a, a character in a video game. And I said, okay, what game? And he said, uh, Metal Gear. And I said, I'm Colonel Campbell. <laughs> and he said, get out of here. And I said, yeah. no, I had, he said, well, pull forward, please. So I pulled forward. That's awesome. and, and the guy said, are you really current to Campbell? And then I said a line from the game. And he said, and he, hey, come here, come here, yeah. come here. <laughs> That's a usual so, reaction. You want to share this. And like somebody and, has to be witness to this. And then, uh, and I've told the story before. I was, my daughter went, went to, uh, I went to school in uh, for theater in Minneapolis at uh, University of Minnesota. Okay. And I had I was back there for a visit and she needed something for her computer. So I went to the Apple store. And, and you know how the Apple stores are all glass and metal and yeah. concrete. And it was a big store. So we go in the front and I'm guy comes to me and we're talking and he said it was morning so my voice was down. And he said, uh, you sound like, uh, like, I said, it sounds like what? He said, it's a, a video game. I said, what game? And Metal Gear again. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm Colonel Campbell. Um, and out here, it's easier to find an actor or somebody who's been in a movie or whatnot, but not in Minneapolis. Yeah. So he was blown away. So he said, can you do, can you do? Snake, snake, you know, game over. And I said, are you serious? Here? It's a, I, I get very loud, you know. He said, no, yeah, it's okay. Most of these guys are gamers anyway. Go ahead, please. So I'm in the front, and there are people walking around, working in the back. Okay. So I did there, you know, snake. Snake, can you hear me? Snake, snake, snake. And for a second, <laughs> And of course, it reverberated around the, the right. place, and there was silence, and then there was applause. So oh, well, people, go. people got 
because I was worried that the guy was going to get fired, but it, it was all good. So I mean, it, it's he would have been fired. I think he would have said it's worth it. You know, yeah, to live that moment. So still, it's, it's Metal Gear more than uh, um, Ben more 10, than, but Metal Gear more than anything. Okay, and even more than Perceptor. Like, this is the latest you. I like it. The Studio Series 86 Perceptor, which I picked up. I'm trying to have, like, I'm not a massive collector as in I'm, I'm getting everything. I just want one version of each character. And this is... That's a good one. Yeah, it's a very good one. Yeah, so, the... Um, I don't get recognized for Perceptor because he doesn't sound... No, he doesn't. He he, he's much, much higher. Job. Yeah. Um, it's... Um, He's like, how was it? Because you worked in season two, the movie, and season three. You're one of the rare that survived from season two to well, season mostly season one character died in the movie and everything. Right. How was it working with the different crew? Was it just business as usual, or was there, I don't know, resentment from people that said, "Ah, man, my character died and you stayed on. That's too bad." Or is it just, ah, "It's the job. It's the business." It's the business. Everybody, yeah. everybody felt the same way, and nobody, um, nobody knew how long the Transformers was were going to last. You know, we're at thirty nine years now. Nobody knew. Yeah. Uh, so it was like, okay, I had a job for a year. Great, cool, cool. And then you're, you're done. It. So I think it was more of that than anything else. Everybody knows that. That's it. it happens, you know. Yeah. Uh, I was just overjoyed that uh, I lived through the movie, but you know what? I've got a uh, a bone to pick with the people who make the the posters for the movie, uh, for the G one movie, because uh, Perceptor is not in oh, any of those. Right. Perceptor None of them. and Blaster, because it's all the new crew. Yep. The Perceptor and Blaster are not there. And they were, you know, in the first act, they were fairly prominent. Yep. And uh, there are several. Uh, I, I've actually found one uh, that was, and I, I even contacted the uh, the artist. Okay. Uh, because he said, yeah, I just had to add Perceptor. I love Perceptor, so I added him. Because in in the five or six different um, posters, Perceptor's not anywhere to be found. I sign them all the time, but it's like, wait a minute, what? Well, I was in the movie. <laughs> I even lived through the movie. Right. You know? And that's one thing with the uh, Michael Bay movie and all that stuff. That's, I think, the one thing I hate the most is when they do the credit. And it's not, they don't say Peter Cullen, star, you know, starring Peter Cullen as Optimus Prime. It's always like way down later, voice of Optimus, Peter Cullen, the recognition that you guys don't get. That's what prompted me. Well, no, yes and no. The, the reason I started my channel was because there was a show on Netflix called War for Cybertron. Uh, it was in three chapters and the voice acting was absolutely atrocious. And I, I'm not disrespecting the actors. I think the voice director didn't push as Wally Bird did. Right. You know, he was, I did a spotlight on him. Um, he's a tough guy. Like he did the army as well and everything. He was indeed. Um, and and I see, I've seen panels with him at uh, TFCon Toronto and people are asking for advice. And first thing he said, well, what have you done? You know, we're going to give you advice, but have you done something on your own to try to do? So very, he, he pushes people to to better themselves and to 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 give the the best performance. So I think that was lacking with uh, the current iteration. So everybody was complaining about the voice acting, especially Optimus. Uh, they got an impersonator to do Peter Cullen, basically, instead of you know. So he he couldn't he could impersonate, but when it got emotional, he couldn't act. Right. So, yeah. so that's which one? Excited. Which one was this? Uh, it's two years ago. Well, what, what was it called? Uh, War for Cybertron. Uh, there was three chapters: Siege, uh, Earthrise, and Kingdom. Which Got Kingdom it. was a mix with Beast Wars characters, and uh, it kind of saved the trilogy because the second chapter just 
It, it, they called it Earthrise because basically it was more like a galaxy quest in space, and then we finally get the Earth and it rose above the moon. So, but uh -huh. there was nothing on Earth, and there's nothing to do with, yeah, you know, the 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 the, the current age of uh, the state of the Earth stuff like that. So it was just. Um, it was a good show overall. The animation, like the characters were actually the toys that we're getting out of this. This is exactly what we saw on screen, animated, compared to the G1 where they looked at the character and made them more, you know, easy to animate. Right. At the time, makes sense. But now with the 3D technology, they just scanned the toys and animated that, so. But most of them didn't transform. So it was, you know, it's it's not the greatest show. Yeah, I never watched it. Good. No. I, I, I wasn't in it, so yeah. No. <laughs> well, no, I get that. That's that's for true. How did you get involved though with the uh, the video game industries? Because you did Diablo, you did Metal Gear Solid, you did tons of other stuff. Is it just your agent gets you, uh, or you show interest? Well, you know what? I think with Diablo, if, if I track backward. Um, Blizzard is down was down in Irvine, California, south of here. Okay. And I had a friend who worked at a place called Knowledge Adventure. And what they did was they uh, they did learning games for kids and also English as a second language. And he asked me to come down and do some uh, English as a second language voiceover stuff. And it was basically lists. Um, I would, okay. I would say, tomato, 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 okay, lettuce. So I just do these lists, and I would do numbers and that sort of thing. And then they would, they would do tons of words. And then, as your person was learning English, they would put, be able to pick these words together and make a sentence. Okay. Okay. So I did that stuff for a while, and then he had me do some stuff where I was. Um, it was it, it the there was a blaster series, math blaster, spelling blaster. These are all for little kids, um, and had me do characters for, for those those games. And a couple of the guys who were involved with that were starting this company or going to be working with this company called Blizzard, and they heard me. And they brought me in to do uh, some stuff. And I think, I, as I recall, now I, I may be out of my mind, but I think that was the connection that I had, uh, the end that I had with Blizzard. Okay. Because I don't remember getting that through my agent. I think I got that because they knew me. Okay. Do you know what I mean? They knew my work and brought me in for Diablo. Um. And you did a great job. Like, honestly, I still have it installed on my computer, and I still play it once in a while. Like, it's just, it was a pioneer game. And I, you know, I just, uh, it's, it's, it's probably the game I've played the most. Honestly. Well, I'll tell you, here's a humble brag. Uh, the narrator stuff, uh, I've mentioned this before. The narrator, I was doing a play at the time. Uh, but they called me and asked if I could, they wanted to do this, all, put all the narrator stuff in. Um, but they needed to fly me up to um, uh, British Columbia okay. to, to, to record it. But it would have to be, I would have to go up late one, one night, rec record, I think it was a Sunday, all Sunday uh, during the day, and then fly me back Sunday evening so I could could get back for my job or but it was something like that okay so they, they flew me up i didn't have the script i got the script while i was in the studio and it was i i think i had a chance to scan but not much time at all and then i had to read and most of that is all one take wow. um that's there are a couple. A lot of, I can do that. Like I, there, can, I, there are a couple. I script my stuff, like my, my not my tour reviews, but my voice acting spotlight. I script it and I read it. And there's so many outtakes. Oh, all of us. I mean, it, 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 I've got outtakes now. 
I got to keep them all because they're, they're ridiculous what I end up saying. But something happened. There were there were a few times that uh, a couple of times I we redid something, and there were there are several times I wanted to redo. And they said no, it sounds great, just keep going. Okay. It's like really. You also worked on uh, Fallout. Uh, you did Fallout Three. You were every old guy. I'm pretty sure that's you, Abraham like, Washington. Uh, you were. And, and it, I can spot you like I'll, I'll be walking in the game because hey, I played Fallout 3 a whole lot too. And I'm like, oh, that's Paul. Oh, that's a, guys, I, I think they had very, uh, a very small crew of voice actor doing Yeah, that. what they what they did there was uh, if you do totally separate characters, they got to pay you for each after three. So what they said, don't change the voice. Just change an attitude. Oh. So, he, he, uh, and that way they could get me to do all those characters without paying me for them. <laughs> Man, this, this is disgraceful. No, I've... no, no. They, what they were, listen, they've been very good to me. Uh, uh, those folks, are, uh, you know. So I, 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 I say that you know, you know, jokingly, but it was basically they were very smart. We don't want totally different voices. Just have a little different attitude, maybe a little bit, maybe this, and maybe maybe a little angrier. So it's going to change everything a little bit. Um, but that's how we got away got away with doing all those voices. Uh, and then when when they called me for Fallout Four, uh, I didn't audition. They just said, you know, can you come, shave your beard, uh, and we'll do Why some shave uh, your beard. We do some facial capture. Oh, okay. So they did more than just the voice stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, just facial capture for. Uh, was that your first time doing facial capture? I don't know if that was the first one or the second one. I've only done it two or three times. Okay, but I'm not sure if that was the first one or not. So is it? I guess it's because it's an easier to match the lip movement and stuff like that. Yeah. on the animation. Yeah. All yeah. right. All right. They're good a- guys. I really like those guys. And you still do theater work as well. Is did the industry change a lot since <laughs> your beginning? Oh yeah, it's it, oh sorry, that got really bright, didn't it? Um, yeah. Well, the pandemic especially changed everything. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, it, it's tough out here in California because you don't do theater for money. You do, because you don't you don't make much money doing theater. New York may be a different deal. Um, okay. You do theater out here because you love it. Um, I love it because you get that instant um, response from an audience. You know whether they like you or hate you or whether if you're doing something right. And you also know that that moment in time uh, that you share the energy that's in that auditorium or whatever you are, even if it's a black box theater and there are 40 uh, audience members versus, you know, 800, that moment in time happens once. And um, it's shared. You're breathing that air. You're, you're feeling that energy um, one time. And then it's gone. Yeah. As opposed to um, something that's recorded, it's there. Now the response to to the listener will change, of course, but because I'm not there sharing it uh, live, it it's different. Um, am I making any sense at all? No, it does. It does. I mean, yeah. a shared moment is something special. You know, Listen, it's, and, it's great yeah. to be recognized and you know, uh, on the street and people know you for your work and everything, but just to have that connection, I can see it. So uh, we have a question from Lone Dragon. He wants to know if you could have asked for collateral pay for the loss of your beard. (laughs) (laughs) Good one. (laughs) Don't I wish. No, it's one of those things that as an actor, you got to be prepared to, yeah, can you shave it off? Well, it'll grow back. Sure. Why not? Shave your head. Well, yeah, my hair's falling out anyway. For uh, Frank and Emmett, you had that huge beard. That was my pandemic beard. 
We, uh, I, I grew the beard because uh, I was doing uh, some Shakespeare. Um, and we, we opened one week and closed the second week because the pandemic hit. Okay. So I had the beard. They said, we're going to, at that point, we thought, ah, well, it'll be over in, you know, six, eight weeks. So that's what everybody thought. Well, the pandemic's not going yeah. to last that long. So I kept growing it. And then I had uh, several auditions for Frank and Emmett. And one thing they wanted was uh, they wanted somebody with a beard, a big beard, because it's an homage to um, to those Muppeteers like Jim Henson, yeah. those guys who have been running uh, those Muppets all those years who are now, you know, dying off. Uh, so we were supposed to, we were supposed to film in, I think it was July, June or July, and then got pushed back because of the pandemic, kept it growing, went to uh, August, pushed back again, kept it growing. September, we finally filmed in October of uh, 20, uh, 2020. So at that point, the beard was pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, I think so, it really fit the character. It yeah. Really good. And my last say, question is. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. If you had something to add. Yeah. The, the writer director of uh, Frank and Emmett um, is one of the head animators at DreamWorks. Oh, okay. Worked on all their big, big animated films. Yeah. Uh, Carlos, um, and he's just brilliant. And that, that the, I think the film looks beautiful, and it was shot in his bedroom. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, it's only twelve minutes long, so I hope people get a chance to to oh, watch it because I'm like I can't recommend this this short movie enough. It's I'm really proud of it. Amazing. Yeah. Anyway, uh, last question is going to be about Star Trek because I'm my mom taught me about you know she introduced me to sci-fi so the original series and the next generation you played ambassador look well and probably one of the funniest episodes of the, <laughs> the series um how's the experience of working on a big franchise like that you know guest starring and interacting with marina certis um uh it was hell Everything about it was terrible. I had to eat chocolate. Yeah. I had to eat desserts. <laughs> All the time. I had to play games, you know, and drink this sweet uh, uh, orange liquid. And then I had to hang around with that uh, beautiful woman. So, yeah. you know, listen, yeah. somebody had to do it. Uh, and I'm glad that I kept any other actor from having to go through what I went. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it was heaven. The, the toughest thing, of course, that you hear all the time on uh, Star Trek, any of those shows, is the makeup. Um, yeah. It takes uh, two and a half, three hours to, in makeup. Um, but I was also really uh, thrilled to do that because... When I was a kid, when you heard the name Westmore, um, Westmore, Bud Westmore and all the Westmores, and they even had a line of, of makeup and whatnot, they were like the kings of Hollywood makeup. Oh, okay. And the Westmores were uh, were doing the makeup. So to get a chance to, to be uh, made up and get a prosthetic uh, uh, forehead, by the Westmore's was pretty cool to me. In fact, when yeah. we when we finished wrap when we wrapped that last day, I very carefully took it off. I said they helped me take it off. They took it off, and I said I'm going to keep that. I'm going to use it at Halloween. And they said, "Great idea." Well, I put it in a safe place, and I didn't find it for six years, seven years. Okay. And at that point, <laughs> it had just shriveled up like that oh, so, it kind of, okay it dried up and yeah uh, okay. yeah i felt <laughs> i had a good idea i just uh put it in too safe a place yeah 
Yeah, my yeah, it was it was sure. it was great to work with all of them, and oh. to be uh, uh, to be on that uh, on that set. I loved when your character has that reaction when he sees a kid for the first time. What's this little thing? What's the and he's so happy. Can I have dessert with this kid? And I was just I was okay. Yeah, that was one of the yeah, yeah, well. There's a line that they cut. Oh, okay. there was a line that they cut because, because okay, you remember the moment when I'm yes. looking at the kid. You're oh, walking with what is this? And she said, "It's a child." The line was, "What is this?" She said, "It's a child." She said, "Oh, can I eat it?" <laughs> because he had no idea. He, he it was totally innocent, and they said, "No, we can't say. Can we eat children?" Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, I guess back in context would have been a little weird, but right, exactly. But it, but from his point of view, it was totally innocent. He'd just been eating everything else. It's like, oh, he didn't. <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, that was. Thank you so much for you know spending the time. Uh, thank everybody in the chat who stayed. Uh, that's always uh, always fun and. I can't thank you enough. So I'm going to any just last thing you want to plug any project you're working on. Well, I'm going to be in uh, uh, Sibfest in uh, Washington, outside of Seattle, on July 8th, doing a con there, and uh, the quoi, Catherine, um, and um, you speak French? Un peu, juste un peu. Uh, and then I'm in uh, the following weekend, I'm in Toronto at TFCon, uh, which I'm really happy about. You're, I don't think that's been announced yet. You're, uh -oh. a, no, 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 it's cool. But uh, did you, is it confirmed TFCon this year? Oops. Uh, yeah, it is. Ah, man, I gotta go now. Sorry. Sorry, Colin. No, I no, no, no. Got out of bed. It's if you, Yeah, it's confirmed. Yeah, all um, right, okay. I'll see you at. Uh, I'm gonna. I'll just do the. The. I probably won't stay for like the three days, but there's a good chance you'll see me. Uh, because there's Venus Terzo and David K going. Those have been confirmed. And uh, but if yeah, it, yeah, there's a good chance we'll see each other. I look forward to I seeing really you in person. Your hand. So all right. Well, thanks okay. everybody. I appreciate it. <laughs> my, my, look at my wife. She's like, "Oh, there's a go, a scoop." <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Oops. All right. Well, uh, hopefully <laughs> that's this is awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, really, Mr. Riding, for taking the time. It's a great honor to have you on my little channel. Don't disconnect yet. Michael Bed did that. I said goodbye, and then he clicked off. So just wait for. Uh, I'm gonna do the outro and everything. Uh, you got it. So, so thanks for uh, everybody for coming uh, for or anybody who's going to watch this later. Uh, thanks for if you liked it, please like, subscribe, hit the bell. Also, leave a comment. I love reading those. Keep coming back. I have more on the way. And remember, nothing in life gives a right to be an asshole. Take care. And now my outro is missing. Uh, no, there it is. All right. Bye, everyone.